Father of the Grooms, the screenplay, William Hovey Smith, 2020. This is Hovey Smith, the backyard sportsman. Forty-six days ago, I started writing on a screenplay based on my novel, Father of the Grooms. Well, the screenplay is now finished. In a previous video, I took you through the steps I took to prepare to start to write the screenplay. And now I'd like to explain to you a bit more about the actual process of producing a screenplay. Now I'm an author and I've written a number of books, uh, more than 20. Uh, most of my books are outdoor titles like Practical Bow Fishing, Backyard Deer Hunting, Extreme Muzzle Loading, and a business title, Create Your Own Job Security, Plan to Start Your Own Business at Midlife, which advocates individual entrepreneurship that you should start businesses as you need them, when you need them, at any age, wherever you might be, to raise whatever money you need. Now, my novel, Father of the Grooms, here. Now, this is a novel that takes place in the United States, in Sicily, and also in Iraq, in part. So it has multiple locations. It also has multiple characters. Basically what happens is we have a Sicilian family living in America in Louisiana. And they've been here for three generations. And dad decides that this year he is not working as much as he once was. And his wife has retired. And his two sons happen to be available that this is the time they should all return for a family trip to Sicily. In three generations they haven't been back, but they have been keeping in correspondence. And once they arrive, they find that through a convenient misunderstanding that their two sons are to be married to two Sicilian gals on Friday. They get there on Monday. And that should they refuse this generous offer that they have been given, none of that family will leave Sicily alive. Hmm. Well, that's a new twist to the shotgun wedding thing. My novel, as it sits right here, is 345 pages long. That's about right for a modern novel these days. Um, so, my task is to reduce it down to a screenplay that is no more than 130 pages long. Mm. Well, 130 pages is really a little long for a modern screenplay, but I'm going to enter it in a writing contest and that's their maximum length. Well, as I have written it at this moment, it's 125 pages. Mm. Okay. So it makes that parameters. Now, how do you do such a thing? In the novel, there are 240 scenes. Well, you could put 240 scenes in a regular length movie, but you know, bling, bang, 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 bang. A lot would have to happen in a, in a hurry. Okay? So, in the screenplay, I've cut this down to 115 scenes. So a lot of very interesting stuff that I wrote in the novel is not going to appear in the screenplay or the resulting movie. So this is why if you read a book and then you see the movie, you're often disappointed because maybe your favorite part in the novel never made it to screen. And this is why. You don't want to sit through a four-hour movie as a rule. Hmm. So there are practical limits on the length that that movie can run. 
you don't have that limit on your book, but you do on your screenplay. So hence, considerable was cut out. What sort of thing? Well, just to start at the very beginning of the novel. We have one of the two sons, Roger. And Roger uh, is a painter. He's a portrait painter. And he moved to San Francisco to make his fortune. Well, he ain't succeeded very well. As a matter of fact, not at all. And he goes and he has a gig job, he thinks, producing a piece of artwork. And that falls through. He goes back to the gal he's staying with in her expensive apartment in San Francisco. And he's supposed to bring back $5,000. He brings back $300. Well, she's had enough. She needs somebody who can support that apartment, or at least his part of it. So she tosses him out and tells him to go back home. Well, he has something to ride in, and it's the busted beast. It's an old scout, too, that... His dad and his brother and he had been fixing on ever since high school. And since his brother was in the military, he inherited it, sort of, and took it to San Francisco. Well, the Scout was never a terrifically sound vehicle to start with. And it is on its, well, not quite last legs, but he's got a journey across the Mojave Desert to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, to making that old beat-up Scout which he calls the Busted Beast, with good reason. So he gets a credit card from his dad, and he manages to pick up $100 from a stranger in San Francisco who takes pity on this poor guy, and he treks off across the desert. Well, his trek across the desert in the novel has him meet some interesting people. One is a trucker, Duvall, who scares him to death. He breaks down on the road. He's rescued by the same guy that he was scared of before, who gives him a tip and enables him to limp that thing in front-wheel drive only to Las Vegas, where he gets repaired, meets some more interesting characters, including some bare-breasted nuns, in Las Vegas, and runs into Duvall again, and Duvall tells him about his brother who has a radiator shop in Van Horn that'll fix another problem with that scout. So gasping and steaming, it makes it to Van Horn, finally, and he gets a radiator put in it. Well, it still seems to crawl across the countryside. He's got all of Texas to crawl. Gets to Louisiana, picks up some crawdads from an interesting fellow named Crawfish Billy, and finally makes it home. How much of that made it in the screenplay? None. Outside of his getting refused for his painting job, getting kicked out of his girlfriend's apartment, and then the next thing we hear from him in the movie is that he arrives with his crow dads at home and meets his brother who's already flown from a rock and been picked up. Hmm. Now his brother didn't get away from a rock quite clean either. When the book opens, an early chapter in the book and actually the opening of the screenplay, he's undergoing a mortar attack in the midst of a sandstorm in a rock. And he, after the dust settles, literally, he opens his laptop to tell his wife at home he's okay, and he gets a message that his wife has left him. Hmm. She's left him for a sanitary engineer in Baton Rouge, which he calls a shit shoveler, undeservedly. San sanitary engineering is a, a respected profession, by the way. But that's the way he sees it at the time. His tent mate, uh, Lieutenant Anton Jones, gets concerned about him that he may blow his brains out. 
takes what he called a nine millimeter discharge. And well, he convinces him that it's long since time that he took some leave and went stateside. And so that's arranged. And that's the reason the two brothers finally arrive at home. All right. And Daddy says, well, okay, it's time for us to go to Sicily. Well, there are others involved. He also has a brother who's gay and a hairdresser. And the two guys have an older sister who works with a brother in their hairdressing salon. So all of them are going to go. In the meantime, in Sicily, things haven't been going all that smoothly either. We have a very violent killing. The two gals are so upset about this that they want to get out of that place. And Luigi the Claw, so named because he lost a hand during World War II, uh, is the uncle to one and the father to the other, decides that it would be a good idea for them to marry these two guys and get out of the country get safely back in the States. And so when the American family arrives, unbeknownst to them, the wedding plans have already been arranged. Hmm. Luigi is going to introduce them to these two very attractive women. And these are good looking guys too, by the way. And he explains to the entire family what's going on. That this is for the safety of these two girls that he loves very much and he wants to get them out of harm's way because they might have a mafia war between the rival families. Because the principal and his segundo have recently been arrested. In other families in southern Italy think it may be time to move in on these lucrative markets in Sicily and may be trying to do so. So, our family is there and they're in Palermo and they're about to tour the island. But the first thing they do is they sit down to this grand banquet, this huge dinner. There are 40 people down this single long table and they're sitting up here at the head of it. And Donia Carlos, who is the wife of the head of the family, and Luigi are sitting at the head of the table, and the two guys are sitting here, and the two girls are sitting here, and they know by this time that the weddings are going to take place, and uh, there are some difficulties. Who is going to marry who? And the choice is to be made right then. In fact, a jeweler has already brought the rings and set them at the guy's play settings. Which one? No difference. Choose. Well, this is sort of an unnerving thing. So one of our guys, Roger, starts playing around with his pickled onion, tries to put a fork in it, it bounces across the table, rises, and falls in one of the gal's laps. She stands up and screams. Murder! He's excited and apologizes and he moves around and he knocks over a water glass on himself and he stands up. Burr! Over at the head of the table. They have chosen, Louise announces and claps. And the whole rest of the table stands up and applauds. That's before a group outside rides by and throws a burst of machine gun fire over the top of the whole building. Things get exciting. Hmm. Somebody doesn't like the idea. Don't know who, but there's somebody out there that doesn't like it. Well, our family and family to be start to tour the island. And they tour some really interesting places. 
and I'm a geologist, and I'm also have interest in archaeology, and Sicily is full of both, and I want to show some of it. But I can't use it all. Ah. So a lot of the really good stuff has to be cut out altogether so I can make links. Hmm. Which pieces have to go? This is like deciding which of your seven children you're going to keep. You can only keep three. So four of them have to go. Hmm. But we do that. So that way we're able to cut the thing down from 240 scenes to 115 scenes. And ultimately produce this thing. Now, we had some help. In the previous video, I described some of the books we use, like these, and most significantly, this. Now, the Hollywood Standard is really uh, sort of one of the Bibles of the present screenwriting industry. And a lot of people use it, and a lot of people recommend it. And if you're going to do a screenplay, by all means, get it and read it and learn it. And we also bought a screenwriting program. The formatting of a screenplay, and I'll show you some pages in a second, is very peculiar. It's not like a novel where you just have straight paragraphs of text running down a page. You have all kinds of little indents, and some things are supposed to be capitalized, and some things are not supposed to be capitalized, and some things are underlined, and some things are not, and some things are worked one way in a one version of the script, but not in the production version of the script, and so on and so on and so on there. And spacings like you would not believe between the different segments have to be just so, and the line length just so, and so on and so on and so on. Here are four typical pages from my script. You keep from driving yourself crazy trying to keep track of all these things manually and format each line of a page as you type it. Uh, you can get a program to do much of that for you. And the program I chose is Final Draft. There are others. Final Draft is a program you buy. It costs about $200. But it saves you all this nitpicky stuff in formatting. And it also gives you considerable help in arranging your script in the approved manner. For example, you'll have a heading of each scene. The first part is interior or exterior, all right? Then there is a space. Hmm. Then there is a location. Where is it? Syracuse. Okay. We're in Syracuse. Another space. Luigi's Villa. Space. We're in Luigi's Villa. Drawing room. Space, time of day, day. That is in caps, and where I've said space is actually a dash. And so you proceed. Hmm. Next line. Choices. You can have action, you can have dialogue. You can have character, and you can have a parenthetical. Action. What's happening? This is where you describe what happened. Luigi walks in the room. Okay? Boom. Character. Luigi. All caps. Esteban, come here. Period. Action. Esteban walks in the room. 
character, Esteban. Yes, period. Look, Luigi, oh, caps, blah, 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 and so on. And uh, there are various other things you do with sound effects. You can apply emphasis, if you wish, in a couple of different ways. You can highlight important things in the script that you want to make sure that the producers are aware of uh, when they film it. And so on. Till you get through the nitty gritty of doing this 130 pages. Ideally, you'd like to get it more like 100. Well, there comes a time for the writer when those magic words appear on the end of the script. The end. So the drudgery of doing the script is now over. Is it finished? No. Movie scripts are in effect never finished until the movie is actually done. There will be innumerable alterations of this script along the way. But for it to be read, for it to be considered, for it to be produced, you have to get it down to an acceptable length first. So I need to knock off uh, more pages out of this script. And that's sort of a heart-wrenching thing, again, for an author to do. It's like deciding amongst your children. But that's the steps that need to be taken. So uh, we will let this rest for a while. I'm going to reread this completely. We'll go through this script again as if I were correcting a student's paper. And then finally submit it to some screenwriting contests, uh, like at the Atlanta Film Festival and others. So that's what's going to happen in terms of the script. Now there are other aspects of the movie too that interest me and that I'm going to do. Luigi the Claw has a very interesting knife. It's uh, done after the bronze knives of an old Sicilian culture that were there even before the Greeks. And this is a wooden mock-up of it. I'm a knife maker. So I'm actually going to produce this knife uh, in Damascus steel. So that's something I will do for the movie in the meantime. Since I also do outdoor books and am familiar with farms and so on and so on and so on, I included several in the screenplay. Among them, is this Colt 1911. There will be a pair of stainless steel pistols used in the screenplay and subsequently in the movie. One of the characters is going to go on a boar hunt and he's going to use a Napoleonic flintlock musket. And I'm also going to build that. I've ordered it and it should arrive in a few months and then uh, we'll have a, another video about building it. So I'm gathering the accessories for the movies as well as uh, doing interesting things on the screenplay itself. But now, this is Hobie Smith reminding you to hunt what you eat and eat what you hunt. Be legal, be ethical, be safe, goodbye, God bless, and see you next time. Your novel, like mine, might have enough material in it to actually tempt you to make this a two-movie project. Don't, at least certainly not for the initial submittal. You can always add another movie or split a script in two, but it's awful hard to peddle one that's overly wrong in the first place. It'll just never get looked at. Now, if somebody wants you to rewrite this thing, uh, okay, if they're paying you, go ahead and rewrite it for as long as their pocketbook will stand it. But if they aren't offering you any money and are just stringing you along and say, oh, if you make this few changes, we can get it, and so on and so on and so on, uh-uh, don't do it. This is a very difficult market. Go ahead, go to film festivals, pedal it yourself, and see what you can do with it. It may be that this particular movie of mine uh, won't make it right now. And I may have to wind up writing another new movie on a shorter theme to get something actually made and produced. Goodbye and God bless. 
See you in the movies.